Hey folks, it's Emily. A lot of people who follow the channel have noted that I've been modeling high-end sea level rise in my state outlooks for about six months now. I made that decision based on the information that's been coming out of Antarctica. That story has been getting weirder and weirder the past 16 months. Let's talk about what's going on. Okay, so you can see how last summer, marked in yellow on the figure there, the ice in Antarctica started behaving real anomalously, like it was doing stuff we'd never seen before. And this year, you can see on the visualization in red, and just to note, this visualization is powered with high quality data. It's rough dated almost daily with NOAA data. This year, it's also weird. You can see this red line for this year is also weird, and in the same way, remarkably similar slopes. It's almost like something has changed from one state to another state. There's recent research trying to explain what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere, why we're seeing such intense heating around Antarctica. Here's a popular press article reporting on some recent research describing it as like a new El Nino pattern. Maybe it's always been there and we just never noticed. Fun. I think it's interesting the pattern described is also a great fit to the near-term modeling in this paper, which is free to download thanks to the kindness of Andrea Tachetto, one of the authors here. And this paper has some nice figures that could potentially be useful in the coming decades. Check it out. Anyway, phase change. Now it's time for stuff that's not through peer review. A hot topic on collapse made it over to the AR Discord. These images, which are on what looks like a pretty hardcore legacy form, certainly appear to show big changes to the tongue of the Thwaites Glacier. If you click on the visuals, a lot of them are GIFs. They allow you to see the sort of scale of the movement. It's actually more alarming if you look a little further back in the forum. I think it's worth asking why am I showing stuff that's not through peer review when this could be taken in pretty alarming and sensationalist uh, directions. It definitely has a lot of people feeling pretty spooked. The reason I'm doing this is because on the science side, the chatter out of Antarctica is so intense. Scientists are observing really weird stuff happening really fast, faster than scientists are able to communicate because peer review takes a long time. You ever try and get a paper through peer review? It's not fun. If there's anyone who doesn't want your stuff out there, you're going to be fighting for what your arguments say. It can take a year, more than a year, to get a paper through peer review. Peer review is a good process. Good peer review, it drives improvements. It gives us some hope that published work is up to a certain standard of quality. But I don't know. There are times observational science gives us some pretty straightforward things to observe as well. And these pictures, to me, they look bad enough to be real. I don't think people who aren't pretty deep inside the science world would be faking images with the grainy old school optics of a classic underfunded remote research team. It's just not an aesthetic that you're gonna think is gonna get the clicks, you know? That's my argument. There's a lot more you could get into here. We are learning about many more serious misunderstandings and rapid change in Antarctica all the time. There is stuff that's getting through peer review. These images appear to show something that just happened, a breakup of the Tongue of the Thwaites Glacier just happening in the last week. Most of us, what it comes down to though, is how can I respond? What's my practical response? There's a lot going on we can't control here. Rapid change, and it's only logical that things are gonna become only more unpredictable. I stay focused on 2C projections because that's close enough to where we are now. It seems more likely than not they're going to provide us with some useful information. I don't know if that's true if we're going to look all the way out to 3C because we're already noticing some really pretty serious weirdnesses emerge at 1.5. If you're a person, though, who thinks about your future or about your family's future, I think it's worth taking some steps in the direction that is more likely to be a little safer in an uncertain world. That means building resilience trying to build a little more give into your system, being prepared for changing conditions that include power instability, extreme storms, and prolonged heat. Ideally, you wanna be doing that type of preparation in a location that's not as likely to present novel life-threatening conditions at 2C. And I, if you look at Antarctica, there are enough signs you don't wanna be building your legacy anywhere particularly close to the beach, unless, and I'm serious here. You're interested in going full on boat person. That'd be a weird thing to do, but our situation here is getting weird. I got weird in 2020. I moved to a highly resilient area. I made a lot of lifestyle changes to cut our expenses as much as I could. In 2021, I was in a place mentally, I felt like I had a shot at getting this operation running because it was my dream to get this information out there when I thought 2C was coming around 2050. 
I thought there was so much we could save if we worked together in the coming decades before 2C. I thought my research and experience on climate communication could help me reach people who could use this information who aren't getting it other ways. And now that timeline, that 2C 2050 timeline, that seems likely to be gone. And that makes me real glad I threw down in 2020 because it seems like this information is going to be pretty important now. If you're a person who supported me and so many of you have supported me in so many ways, I thanks for keeping me going. I'm really grateful. And I feel like it's worth saying, if we got some years left on this stage, there's still a lot that can be done. And I feel like it's also important that you not discount your life. If this is our shot, if this is the space we have to operate, you're alive now. I moved out here in 2020. I wanted to make more habitat for insects because the insect collapse, right? Now, when I go outside, I see like 40, 45 species of pollinators at my place any given day. There are different species of bee right now that are kind of fighting to get in and out of the squash blossoms in the morning. Every morning, there's like big traffic problems. There are a lot of people who are aware of all this bad stuff happening, and it's easy to get sucked into it. I would encourage you, unless it's a research area or particular interest of yours, don't go down a big Antarctica rabbit hole because of this Thwaites stuff right now. A lot of us, we find out more information because we're trying to protect ourselves. I don't know that you're going to find that looking in this direction. You'll probably just find more information that you should maybe get way, way, way back from the coast. That's the information that could protect you is the information indicating big vulnerability, increased vulnerability for coastal areas, model 10 feet rise, give it a margin, a healthier response than going down, 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 looking for information. Might be to think about something that's more inside your ability to control and take an action step. Some of the best informed people out there are continuing to stay in very vulnerable situations because sometimes our circumstances cause us to be detached and sometimes action can be hard to impossible. Like be hard to impossible, not oh, it feels hard to impossible. It can be impossible for people to act. If you're fortunate enough to have a capacity for action, this is a good time to develop and strengthen your capacity for action. We're moving into a world where things are going to happen that none of us have seen before. We can't prepare for everything, but we can prepare for what we can. This includes developing the mental and emotional resilience to live in this time, to stay fully alive, to save what we can save. There will be more headlines about tipping points, for sure. I suggest you ask yourself in relation to this news that will continue to emerge, does this information change what I can control? And does this information change my response plan? We're in an intense situation here. We can't control it. But for many of us, we do have choices we can make. We do have ways we could respond to the realities of change we're observing across Earth systems. I encourage you to take one step today. I mean, like, do you want to have bees as long as we possibly can or not? I'm on team bees. I tried to identify some places where I could do something and I'm doing what I can. And I think that it matters. I think it matters if we should do what we can. Let's do it, you know? Let's get ready. Everyone, thanks for watching. I want to take a moment to thank the AR community, the donors, the volunteers, everyone spreading the work online, especially everyone doing the work on the ground. What you're contributing matters, and I feel a lot of gratitude towards you. Let's get ready, preferably comfortably away from the increasingly furious sea and talk with you again soon.